Hi everyone, I'm George Hawks, and this is the world's first unlocked iPhone. Some of, might, sorry. Some of you might remember that from my YouTube video. And um, that was the day, that was the day that we first uploaded the first hacked firmware to the iPhone and booted it up and put in my T-Mobile SIM card and looked at it and it actually said T-Mobile and I dialed a phone number and it actually made the call. It's pretty amazing. Yes, it's true, I did trade the second unlocked iPhone for a Nissan 350Z and three more iPhones. And I was on CNN, but it wasn't about all that. It was about hacking as a community, and it was about making a really cool device even cooler. So I figured here I'll tell the story. I'll tell the story from the beginning, what the community was like. And I've had some interesting experiences throughout my iPhone hacking time. So the first day, my friend and I went to the local shopping mall. We got there at about... 3 p.m., we thought we'd be like the first ones there with our three hours before the release. And we get to the Apple store, and we see the line, and maybe the line was like 30 people. And then we see the next group of line, and there's another 30 people. And then we keep walking back, and there had to be 200 people outside the Apple store. So we actually waited online at the AT&T store. There were about 10 people there. The 200-person line at the Apple store went quicker than the 10-person line at the AT&T store. But, uh, so we ended up with iPhones, and my friend went home, and... He had at and and I had T-Mobile, and I had no intention of buying at and I was like, I'm going to crack this thing. And my friend's like, dude, you just spent $500. You're not going to crack it. I'm like, I'll crack it. So I ran a uh, USB packet sniffer on his activation session. And when he activated the phone with at and I, I was like, I'll do a replay attack. I'll put it on my iPhone and activate my iPhone the same way. Well, it's not that easy. USB sniffers do not work that well. I should have been doing a... Uh, I should have been running like Wireshark or something and sniffing the uh, Ethernet packets that were being sent to Apple. But I didn't do that. So um, I headed home and I put some posts up on some forums. I'm like, hey, who's out there hacking this thing? And I ran across an IRC group, the Hackintosh group. And I put my screen name out there too. And this guy IM'd me. Uh, his name was Lupin Glade. And he is the uh, coder of the apt app installer, installer.app. He's the coder of Summerboard, which gives the app, he was the which gives like the scrolling ability to have multiple applications. And he was the first guy who I am to me to talk about the iPhone. So after that, we, we got in the IRC group. And what we started doing was iTunes uses this uh, DLL file. Our DLL is dynamically linked library and exports a set of functions, which give the functionality for the computer to communicate with the iPhone as a device. I mean, to rewrite all these drivers from scratch is very difficult. So whatever we can use that's already pre-written, let's use it. So we got in there. Uh, Windows is called a DLL and Mac is called a framework. And we found these functions like AM Device Connect and AM Device Activate. And we wanted to run these functions while the iPhone was connecting. And we could connect to it. And then on July 3rd, DVD John, the person who's famous for cracking the encryption on DVDs, he's amazing with like, uh, like web programming and spoofing servers and stuff. He came out with the first activation hack. And you could use this server, and you could activate your iPhone. Well, that night, we figured out the DLL calls that iTunes was using. We released our version of the iPhone activator. And it was on July 4th, so we were like independence for iPhones. And we put this out there, and I had the second illegally activated iPhone in the world. And activation means you can get it and use Safari on Wi-Fi, and you can use it as an iPod but we were still really far away from actually using this thing as a phone on another network. So as the days went by, one of the first exploits we found was a jailbreak exploit. And um, when you, the iPhone had a file system server running called AFC. And this file system server is what allows iTunes to like upload MP3 and movie files and sync your calendars and to sync your contacts. And it uploads them to a CH root jail on the iPhone. A CH root jail only allows you to access a few files. But we found an exploit using, when the iPhone is restored, it copies some files, and we found an exploit using this file copy thing to rewrite over the file that opens the services on the iPhone. And it actually loads that Apple file system server. We managed to exploit it to, instead of loading in this CH root jail, we loaded it on the root. And we loaded it there, and the first time we did a quote-unquote LS, it's like, AFC file system directory list. We saw things like bin, it's set, var, uh, user. And these are the directories on Linux. And we realized this thing is really running Mac OS X. And now we have full file system access. We could read and write anywhere on the file system. And that was a huge step for us. So we started messing around with some of the UI things. Like we could switch the place of the phone and the Safari icon. And we put 
pictures up on the internet, and people were like, whoa, how are you doing that? And we could upload ringtones to the iPhone, because that was something Apple didn't include native support for, and I showed my friends that my iPhone had a ringtone, but they're still like, Dad, you can't call anybody on it. So we're going to unlock this thing. And unlocking is what really took a lot of the time. So I was working with a team called the iPhone Dev Team, and they're iPhoneDevWiki.com. And I was working with them, and I was discovering a lot of things about the baseband, but they didn't want to make these things public. They wanted to keep them. This is this dev team secret information. You know, you don't just put this stuff on the internet. And I'm like, that's what we're here for. We're here to make information about this device public. So I wrote up like a two-page document of everything that was known about the iPhone baseband. And I put it on the internet on the forums, and they flipped out at me. They're like, you can't put this stuff up. You didn't even discover all this stuff. Who are you to go and write this? I'm like, look, it's free information. And they got pissed at me. I got thrown off the team. So I started my own team, went to another IRC server, I went into Undernet, and I was like, come follow me. We'll keep everything open. I'll make posts on my blog, which I'm sure many of you have seen, iPhoneJTech.blogspot.com. The posts on my blog, and I'll keep you updated to the minute about what we're doing. This isn't going to be like the dev team. And a lot of people joined. And the first thing I said is that, let's approach this from a different angle. The dev team was approaching it from a softer angle. They're really good with, um, like IDA, they're good with disassembling software. What I'm good at, and uh, my previous project was reverse engineering Texas Instruments DLP. Like, that's the chip that's used in all the projectors, and it's all closed. There's no data sheets. There's nothing like that. So I reverse engineered the protocol that it's used. It's all documented on my other blog, dlpgoesdown.blogspot.com. And this is what I was good at, hardware reverse engineering. So we needed an iPhone to take apart. $500 device, right? I put it out there. I'm like, you know, I think we should set up like a donation group. PayPal me money. I mean, we don't have to. It's up to you. I'll just, we'll, we'll try to get the effort done faster. That night, this guy PMs me, Jay Petrie. And he's like, Sounds like the cops are coming in here. So. This guy uh, PMs me, Jay Petrie. And he's like, you know, I live right in Anglewood, New Jersey. And that's 15 minutes from my house. And he's like, you don't have an extra iPhone. Come by and pick it up. And he handed me an 8 gig iPhone right there on the spot. And that was amazing that the community could really work like that. And he's like, you know, I, you know, you might not get this device back in one piece. I'm like, I don't care. Just put all the pieces in a bag and give it back to me. That's good. Really great. I mean, I found some people in the community were hard to deal with. But for every one of them, there's some guy who's incredible like this. Gives me the iPhone. I started disassembling it that night on my blog. And I started looking at the chips and seeing what data sheets I could find. And the iPhone structure is structured basically like this. It has a communications board, which is really a GSM modem. It just has, it has a serial port going into it, and you can send it AT commands. And there are commands like, to dial a number, it's AT, DT, and then the number. It's, it was simple. The interface between them was simple. And that board also had the Bluetooth and the Wi-Fi chip on it. And then there's the logic board. And the logic board is what has, like, the ARM 11 CPU, and that's what runs Mac OS X. But the exploits had to be done on the baseband board, because the baseband couldn't natively call out with another SIM card. It was... It had what's called an M uh, it was locked to an MNC. It had what's called a network personalization lock, and it would only work with AT&T SIM cards. Because every AT&T SIM card, uh, the MCC MNC is 310410, and it would check to make sure that the SIM card inserted was 310410. So what we had to do was get rid of this check. Now, in every embedded system, there's code that runs, and this code is known as firmware, the same way an operating system runs on a computer, firmware runs on an embedded system. And we had, from some of the exploit we, exploits we'd done earlier, a dump of this baseband firmware. So we started looking into it, started looking, looking for exploits. But even if we changed the firmware, we couldn't upload the modified firmware. Asymmetric cryptography. Revolution back in the 70s. Symmetric cryptography works like this. You have one key. This key is used to encrypt and decrypt data. Asymmetric cryptography works like this. You have two keys, a public key and a private key. Say Alice wants to send a message to Bob. Bob publishes his public encryption key on the internet. Alice can use Bob's encryption key to encrypt a message, send it across the wire, now, if Eve here is trying to sniff that message, she can sniff it, but she doesn't have Bob's secret decryption key, which she needs to decrypt Alice's message. So when Bob gets Alice's message, runs it through the secret decryption key, and can decrypt it. And that's the way the baseband was what's called signed. So um, 
you got a lot of code, this firmware code, right? And this firmware code goes through a hashing function. It turns it into a hash. It's also known as a digest. You think of it as like, it's a unique number which identifies the firmware. And if you change one little bit in the firmware, the whole digest changes. And this digest is encrypting in faraway land with the private key by Infineon. Your phone has the public key. It decrypts this digest. It decrypts this uh, RSA block and gets a digest out. And that digest needs to match the digest or hash of what you uploaded. And if it does match, the firmware will be uploaded. If it doesn't match, it won't. So we couldn't upload this firmware to normal, normal, uh, normal channels. So um, this guy, iProof, this guy could find anything on the internet. He was one of the, one of the people. He, he was over in Russia. And he was one of the people I worked with. And he could find anything. Right, he could read Russian, he would read all these forms, and he'd be like, you know, there were exploits against the Siemens phones, which used the same chipset, the S-Gold 2, which is the same chipset the iPhone uses. And he's like, oh, well, there's this test point exploit. You know, these things run a boot ROM. And I was like, oh, well, what's the boot ROM? He's like, well, I don't really know, but I know someone who does, and he got me in contact with this guy, Lazy Coder, and he did a lot of the work on the Siemens phones. And he got me a dump of this boot ROM off one of the S-Gold 2 Siemens phones. And I loaded it up in IDA, and I disassembled it, and I saw something. I can send code over the serial port. And then the uh, boot ROM does a check. And if certain locations in the flash memory are blank, this code, unsigned, I sent him send anything I want over the serial port, would be executed. And this is exactly what we needed. But how do we make those flash locations read as blank? Our first idea was to disable the flash chip. You know, disable the flash chip, all the data lines will float, hopefully the S-Gold 2 has some pull-up resistors, and it'll read us once. We'll have pull-down resistors, so that was out. We needed to actually erase the flash. But if we could erase the flash in the first place, then we could unlock it. So we couldn't erase the flash, because these locations were in the bootloader. And the first hex 20,000 is the bootloader. And you can't erase that, it can't be touched. Because the bootloader is actually what updates the firmware, and something can't erase itself. So here was the genius of the exploit. And I remember the night I came up with this, and this is pretty good. I can't erase this location here. But before you write to flash memory, it has to be erased. So when I'm writing the firmware up here, it has to be erased before I write that. So I found a way I could erase the firmware up here. But it was reading from the locations down here. So here's what the uh, actual hardware exploit was. The flash has address lines, right? What if I pull one of those address lines high? It thinks it's reading down here from hex 1000. But say I pull address 17 high. It's actually reading up here from hex 21000, which I had erased. So I soldered some wires to address line uh, 17, soldered a wire to the plus 1.8 volts, connected the two together, ran the boot ROM, sent some code over serial, and it sent the letter D out the serial board. And at that point, I realized the iPhone was unlocked. It wasn't actually unlocked yet, but I knew that the exploit was found. I could run unsigned code. I could make this code do whatever I wanted. So the next thing we had to do was, uh, um, next thing we had to do was write our own loader, our own way to load an unsigned firmware. So it took some time, and I talked about the details of this a bit this morning. I won't go into it here. It took some time, but we eventually wrote a loader, and we could write anything we wanted into the flash memory. So the first thing we did was rewrite the original firmware and see if it still ran. And sure enough, it still did. And the next thing we did was modify a string in the original firmware and see if it still ran. And sure enough, it did. And when we asked the firmware to print out that string, the string would be changed. And now that we could change the firmware, it was just a matter of finding the patch. This guy, Gray, another guy in Russia, amazing at disassembly. He's like, I think I can find the patch. Come online tomorrow at 3 in the morning, your time. And I'm like, okay. So I set an alarm clock. I went to bed at 2 in the morning, woke up at 3 in the morning. And he sent it to me. He's like, oh, just change. Uh, I don't remember the exact location. It's like A027438484, I think. And all I had to change was one bit. I just had to change. Uh, well, technically, it was, there was one one group of four bits. I had to change 1A to EA. 1A is branch if not equal. EA is branch. 
it involved changing one line of code in three megabytes of code. And this check, it was just a check to see if your phone was unlocked. We patched that out, uploaded the patched firmware, and so the phone put in a T-Mobile SIM card, didn't give me anything about invalid SIM, and it made a call. Made a call on T-Mobile. And that was an amazing day. The days before that I knew it was getting close, um, my sleep schedule was kind of like, I would, go to, I would go to bed, I don't know, I'd wake up at like 6 p.m. I'd have my mom make me dinner. I'd go out. On those last few days, I was completely ignoring everybody. But I'd go out, I'd hang out with my friends. I'd get home at like 1 or 2 in the morning. And then I'd work on the iPhone for 10 hours, and I'd go to bed at noon the next day. And um, every morning at 5.30, I would, I would go out running, and I'd go get bagels. And on the way back from bagels, I was imagining, today's going to be the day that we unlock the iPhone. And the day we did, it was really... It was amazing that I could finally make a call. And that morning, I had my sister film that YouTube video. It actually took about two hours to film because uh, I couldn't find my TV cam. So we were trying to use an analog camera. I eventually found the TV cam. But um, film that YouTube video. Hi, everyone. I'm George Hotz. This is the world's first unlocked iPhone. And I said that the method would be released within a week. Just wanted to try to refine it and make it easier for people. Well, the next morning, I went through the 10 steps on the blog, and the 10 steps were the 10 steps to a harbor unlock. And by that night, people had followed it, and other people around the world had unlocked iPhones. And by the end of that week, 100 people had unlocked iPhones. By the end of the next week, 10,000 people had unlocked iPhones. So that same day I posted the steps, I got a call from the Bergen Record. And the Bergen Record did a little interview. It's a local newspaper. I live in Bergen County, so I thought I'll be on, like, the bottom of page 7. It'll be... Yeah, whatever. It's cool. I'm in the newspaper. No, it was on the front page. Had a big picture. Teen from New Jersey cracks iPhone. And I wake up the next morning. I woke up really early. I woke up at like 10 a.m. Actually, my mom woke me up. She's like, yeah, you know, uh, CNN, Fox, ABC, and CBS calls. I'm like, oh, really? So that, that was, they, they sent a car service. I went into the city, went through the studios, did the TV interviews. What was it about that? It was about opening the iPhone to a community. And let me see what time it is. Oh, 119, good, I still got time to talk. Um, but opening the iPhone to a community. Uh, and after that, I kind of, kind of left the iPhone scene and I came back when firmware version 1.1.1 came out and went to hack against that. And then iPhone SIM free, who everyone had thought was a fake company, came out with a software unlock. And what they exploited was a, was a flaw in the, uh, the RSA functions. The RSA is that asymmetric cryptography I was talking about before. And they exploited a flaw in that. Because it's implemented on an embedded system, they used an exponent 3 public decryption key, and that can be exploited. It's long and technical. In fact, I haven't even figured out exactly how they did it yet. But um, the dev team came out with a software unlock, and they found this exploit. And here's what the software unlock exploit was. After all the work that was actually put into hardware exploit, all we really had to do was this. Remember what I said before about the hashing function on the firmware? Well, in order for it to be hashed, it already has to be loaded into memory. So when you use, well, BB Updater was the program that updated the firmware. When you load it in, it loads in the firmware chunk by chunk by chunk by chunk by chunk. It loads it in whether the hash is valid or not because it can't hash it until it's loaded but it doesn't load the first hex 400 section. And this is the section, if you're familiar with microcontrollers, that contains things like the start vector. And without the start vector, the code just jumps to some arbitrary location and the processor halts. And that's what it was doing when you tried to upload unsigned firmware. So it keeps this first hex 400 in memory, but it loads the rest, no matter what it was. But without that hex 400, the code won't run. So the whole exploit was to start writing 400 bytes earlier. That's all it was. Start writing 400 bytes earlier, write 400 bytes of garbage, write your start vector section, write your firmware. The hash check fails at the end, but who cares? It's 400 bytes of garbage you don't want written anyway. And that was a software unlock. And if someone had just came up to me, maybe three weeks before the hardware unlock came out, and said minus hex 400, that's all it would have taken to figure out the software unlock. You yeah, really, no one thought Apple was that stupid to put that in the firmware like that. No, actually, that's not Apple. That's actually Infineon who wrote the uh, bugs into the firmware. But, um, so 1.1.1 1 .1 came out, and over this weekend, I put a server up which could 
repair. Technically, uh, the way we patched the unlock, it actually damaged the security zone on the iPhone. So I put a way to repair the security zone up, and the dev team came out with an unlock for 1.1.1. But actually, instead of actually unlocking the phone, it just patches out that MNC check. That MNC check is what I was talking about earlier, that uh, actually checks to see the MNC is unique. It's called mobile network code. It's unique to the network. at and is 410, and it would have to match 410 in order for the SIM card to work. So you just pass that check out. And then things like 260, which is T-Mobile's MNC, would work fine. So it was really an adventure, and it was, it took all summer, and I probably did put about 500 hours into it. And I was obsessed with cracking the iPhone, but it was worth it. I had a nice car now. It's a good deal, so. Any questions? Um, I got into electronics in first grade. For Christmas, I got one of those Radio Shack 30-in-1 electronics project kits. And I didn't know how this stuff worked, but it's like, oh, connect the wire here, connect the wire here. And the LED would blink. And, all right, and you got a blinking LED. But at the time, that was fascinating. Now I know that you just go to Radio Shack, you pay 99 cents, you buy an LED that already blinks. But ooh, I wired it up and had a transistor in the circuit. I knew transistors were in computers, and that was pretty cool. But you know, um, I just started playing with it. When I, when I was in uh, seventh grade, I bought a Parallax basic stamp and started playing with microcontrollers. And I started playing with uh, the Scenix SX microprocessor. And I was really into NTSC video, figuring out how that, how that signal worked. And then when I went to high school, there was an electronics lab there. And I'm really sad they closed it down the year after I left. But I learned a lot there. And then my senior year, I did an internship with this guy who's working in the field as an electrical engineer, Joe Barbetta. There's a shout out to him on the blog, too. He's the one who soldered uh, the JTAG interface, because we were going to use a JTAG interface. I skipped over a lot of stuff. A lot of it's summarized on the blog, so it's really into the technical details. It's all there. But, um, yeah, and I learned, I, I just learned tons. I don't know, I love this stuff. It's fun to play with. Yep. What do I think of the iPhone as a phone? I use it. The iPhone as a phone, you know what? It's not as revolutionary as all the hype was. Apple's big on hype. I mean, technically as a phone, the same way iPod is an MP3 player. It wasn't that revolutionary as an MP3 player, but it's Apple. Apple made it. It has the Apple logo on the back. It is a very nice phone, and the multi-touch interface is incredible. But the main reason I use it as a phone is because of how upgradable it is. Because now it's been hacked. It's probably the most hacked phone on the market. We can hack this thing to do anything. Um, I wrote a program on here to generate magnetic stripe cards. Like, you know how you, you swipe cards anywhere? I wrote a program to generate the data that's on the card, and I built an electromagnet that I can plug into the headphone port. I put that into the card reader, run a program I wrote on the iPhone, and it's just like swiping the card. So I, I go to RIT, and there's card swipers on every door. So I found some cool tricks that let you open doors. Love it. It's fun stuff. I, I love working on projects like this. And I really think that's the best way to learn. Just, when I came into the iPhone, I had never used IDA before. I didn't know that there was a kernel mode and a user mode. Like, basic computer things I didn't know. But I learned them as I went along. And that's, I mean, go into everything with an open mind and you'll, you'll figure it out. Just Wikipedia. Wikipedia is great. Go on the internet. You will learn. I learned so much just from, like, what I would do. I would uh, I'm probably going on too long about this, but go on a web page and start reading it. And when you come across something you don't know, look that up. You start reading that web page. When you come across something you don't know there, look that up. And eventually your train of thought takes you somewhere totally, totally somewhere else. But you know a lot about a lot. You can put that all together. And you just have such a toolkit at your disposal. And that's what let me happen. Yeah, I've got a question for you. Yep. Um, I've read your blog and, and looked at a lot of the stuff. And you said it was very easy for other people to modify the iPhone to hack it after you did it. So why did the guy give you three iPhones and a 300Z? What did he get out of that trade? I, I never understood that part of it, and nobody ever talked about it. Why when did you do that, and what did you get from it? When I put the iPhone on eBay, I didn't sell it as an unlocked iPhone. Look, if I was into selling unlocked iPhones, I would have kept the method secret, and I would have put 10 iPhones up for $2,000 or $3,000 each, and I would have got the money, and I would have made a lot more money that way. But you know what? It's, it's not about that. I wanted to put the method out there. And I didn't actually put the iPhone up until eBay, on eBay until I was sure that someone had successfully replicated my method. 
Because I don't want to be one of those guys who's like, oh, I know how to unlock it. And if you want to know how to unlock it, you could pay me money and I'll tell you. I didn't want to do that. I wanted to try to make the steps on the blog and as easily accessible as possible. Yeah, I know they were a little confusing to read, but I thought that people would go through and summarize them. And people did. People did. They went through and they made steps that anyone almost could do. But um, I put the iPhone up on eBay and I was like, if you're looking for an unlocked iPhone, don't buy this. You'll find unlocked iPhones for a lot cheaper somewhere else later. This is a collector's item. This is a piece of cell phone history right here. Uh, I, it sounded a little corny saying it, that I had created a piece of cell phone history, but eh, whatever. I put, I signed Geohot on the back of it, and I was like, all right, maybe I'll get like $2,000 for this. Maybe I'll get $1,000 for it, either way. So uh, I came home after the TV interviews, and my friend texts me, and he's like, dude, you're a millionaire. What, what do you mean? Well, look at the eBay auction, and it's up to $99 million. So, uh... That started my dispute with eBay, which ended up in my eBay account being banned because I'm 17, and if you're 17 with an eBay account, that's illegal. But um, I just put it on the blog. I was like, does anyone want to buy it? And I got an offer for $10,000, and I got an offer for $25,000. And then I was contacted by the CEO of this company, Certicell. And he's like, all right, what do you really want for it? And my original summer project was... Um, I had a Mitsubishi 3000 GT, 1995, that was stick shift, and I broke the clutch. I didn't know how to drive stick shift. Like, I step on the gas, and I just take my foot off the clutch, and this car start jerking back and forth. I didn't know how to do it. I eventually got better, and I'm good at it now, now that I have a 350Z. But uh, that was my original summer project, changing the clutch on my 3000 GT. And, well, I took the car apart. I changed the clutch, but never really put it back together. That's how it is with a lot of my stuff. But normally when I don't put stuff back together, it ends up in the drawer of stuff that will never go back together. The car's kind of big. So this car was strewn out all over my backyard, and my parents weren't too happy about that. But um, So I'm like, you know, I, I was kind of hoping I'd get a car from this. He's like, okay, what car do you want? And I'd watched uh, The Fast and the Furious 3 the night before, and the bad guy was driving a 350Z. I want one of those. So I got it, and uh, the three iPhones I got, I wanted to send them out to my teammates. I mean, all right, I was getting a car, and they were getting iPhones. I was hoping they wouldn't feel gypped. But uh, I sent one back to Jay Petrie, the guy who donated the iPhone at the beginning, a brand new one. I actually hardware unlocked it for him. I sent one out to iProof in Russia, which hasn't really gotten there yet because of the Russian post. But um, I asked Ray if he wanted one. He's like, no, I already got one. But uh, yeah, I want to get some iPhones to send out to my team members. But I think we're done. So, uh, enjoy your unlocked iPhones.